Hey guys, Joe here, and today you're going to be seeing the follow-up for that computer right there, and it's funny to get it in perspective, I'm actually pointing at a wall, of the i7-7700K build using the parts I picked up from Friday's video. Really quick, you will see that my hair gets long all of a sudden during the video. Probably not too much, but as I was editing it, I noticed how bad my hair was like sticking out of my hat. And... <sighs> I figured it was time for a haircut, so I did. If you're new to the channel, thank you so much for checking it out. I really appreciate it. If you'd like to help the channel grow, maybe hit that like button, subscribe button, leave a comment, and maybe use my Amazon affiliate links. I'll link all the stuff I use to make my videos down in the description below. As a note to people that have been following me for a while, I will be getting much more active on my social media accounts. That way you guys can get a hold of me. I get a lot of questions about computers, firearms, and cars, so I'm thinking we should probably do something so that I can be reached by even more people. Let's get back to the point of the video, and that's this computer right here. This is a PC Find. I used to do them every month, but now that I'm fully disabled, I can't do them quite as often. But this computer came to me via Facebook Marketplace, which doesn't happen as often as you would think, but it can happen if you're quick. And that's what happened in the video up here. I explained how I got it. I've been looking for a system to replace my X99 since it blew up last year, I think it was. And I finally got it replaced and I sold it because I couldn't trust it anymore. Well, I decided to go with Intel when this deal came up. In this video, you're going to watch me tear apart the system I bought in order to swap the parts over into a much, much nicer case or newer case in any case. Case, 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 case. And I'll go over a couple of tips and tricks and ideas that I use when I'm building a computer as well as talk you through a couple of rookie mistakes that a lot of people make when they're assembling their computers. When we're done with that, you'll see a quick shot of it complete and then you'll come back and we are going to talk about the money factor, which I hate talking about. And the air quotes weren't necessary, he said. Ha, quoted myself. So this is an NZXT, I think they were called Phantoms back in the day, the case. Uh, correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. It's an older style case that holds a lot of drives. Way more than I would ever put into a case. But I like the case, it's in really good shape, so I'll keep it and probably use it for something else. But inside the case we have the MSI PC Mate Z270 motherboard. It's nothing fancy, but it gets the job done. It's got dual M.2 spots and it doesn't actually have SLI support. That's why it only has one shielded Time 16 slot up top there, or one armored one, in order to make it more secure. Uh, the guy I bought it from told me he was trying to run his 970s in SLI and it just wasn't working. Could be a BIOS thing, I'm not sure. I'll check it once I get it set up. However, probably won't keep that motherboard. Don't even know if I'm going to keep the whole system, but I'd rather get something that is definitely SLI capable. The RAM is Ripjaws. 5 DDR4 3200 megahertz stuff focus there you go and it's a 32 gigabyte kit which would be more than enough for gaming and light production workloads and final piece of the puzzle is the thermal take water 3.0 240 ring RGB edition it's a 240 millimeter radiator with dual 120 fans on it and they are RGB rings Fans, and as you know, I like my thermal take fans. I think they're pretty cool. And the integrated LED bars for the standard LED fans looks very nice. Has SP120 fans. These are static pressure. Uh, one of these days I will show you the difference between an SP and an airflow. And in the box, it literally has everything. Radiator, duh. And it has a standard Asetek pump on it. You can see he actually used it. He put it on that motherboard because he told me he was going to try to sell it as a complete computer. But then he decided that parting it out would make him the same money. Thermaltake RGB controller. It also controls the fans if I'm not mistaken. I'm probably mistaken. But that's cool because that will control the ring fans and the mounting kit for LGA 1151 because again he was putting it on here. You can easily order kits for like uh, AM4. Additionally, you could actually swap out uh, water cooling gear for hybrid graphics cards because it's a standard Asetek uh, water block on there. You would have to disassemble it. Don't recommend that. Now, none of you have actually seen the video of what I did here, 
which is putting a 250 milliliter water cooler or reservoir pump combo into a Matrix 70 case. And it's been together for one day. I found that deal on top of which this system works and it cools it down great. It actually runs very cool. However, this case is not designed for a full hardline water cooling kit in there. And I was originally gonna swap it all out for soft water tubing, but I've decided that this case is not optimal for that. So what I'm gonna do is all of this is getting ripped out. Motherboard, cooler, radiator, all that stuff is coming out. And in its place is gonna go that i7-7700K I'm going to reuse the 1080 because, let's face it, it's a 1080. That's a still a very good ultra 1080p high settings 1440p card, especially these four, the Win Edition EVGAs. And then we're going to see what the gaming performance difference is. And I don't have before specs uh, right in front of me, but I will tell you that with IPCs, instructions per clock, and frequency dependency of newer games and newer titles, even though this has four more threads and two more cores, the 7700K should walk all over it in terms of gaming performance. So, I guess the first thing I have to do is I have to drain this loop, and that's the biggest pain in the butt in this case, is I was not able to run a hardline tubing extension to put a drain in it which means I'm gonna to have to put a soft tube on the top of the fill port because this pump only has one outlet to a block as it is in this case, which means I'm gonna to have to put a drain tube into the top of the reservoir, tilt the system up and drain it that way. It's not a big deal, it's very easy to do, it's just flipping annoying. So I'm gonna to get to that and uh, yeah, I'll come back to you, you don't need to see that. This computer, in this form has been together for roughly 23 hours. So thumbs up for that, 23 hours. Some people wear their underwear longer than that. What we need to do now is drain it. But before we do that, I'm going to take out the 1080 just in case there is a leak. I'd rather not get coolant all over a 1080. I do give kudos to Deep Cool for this case being very easy to work with. The, for example, this is one of the things I like in more modern cases is the PCI Express from the motherboard to the actual expansion bays. The screws are on the outside of the case so you don't have to try to get a screwdriver past a spot like that where the side glass normally sits. This is much more convenient. It does have a mount cover for here because you can put a vertical mount in there and I may do that but either way I'm not putting that cover back on. It's annoying and I don't care. Plus I like to change my hardware a lot. Hell of a card. If you can get one for a reasonable price, I highly suggest it. You can click up there to see what I got mine for. Without the uh, graphics card and fans in there, it actually looks like there's a lot of room, doesn't it? Except for, yeah, this is a really bad tube run that I did because I didn't plan ahead. I could have made this run come down lower and straight across if I dropped the radiator down, but I was originally planning on putting a drain down here, and the only way I could have done that is if I hadn't dropped the radiator. And by the time I figured out it wasn't going to work, it was too late, and I'd already bent some tubing. So next thing to do is drain this, and as I said, I'm just going to take this cap off. As you can see in there, it has one extra port there. I'm going to just hook a tube up to that, and you'll see why it's going to work as soon as I get it hooked up. So other channels have demonstrated this, specifically Jay's Two Cents, you can see that it's actually not leaking at all. This tube is not blocked in any way, yet no fluid is coming out because there's nowhere for air to get into the system. So I've tilted it up on its side and I'm actually going to take my sound bar because it's a large piece of plastic and put it under the back side, or under the bottom actually, which will allow this system to tilt. So that when I actually go ahead and open one of the fittings, it's going to drain out. Also using a mouse mat so it doesn't move. So we are getting a little bit of bubbling and some fluid coming out. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let it slowly burble out until it starts draining more. Better safe than soaking. There you go. It's starting to speed up because there's more air in the reservoir now. And going slow ensures that you save as much fluid as possible because this stuff is $20. $17 plus tax a bottle. It's hard to see if you actually look closely at this tube. 
you'll see that it's actually still got fluid in it because the air is stuck at the top. So when I set this down, it should actually drain back into the reservoir. So the system is not 100% drained. There is still some fluid in the radiator and a little bit at the bottom of the res. You don't need to drain it all while it's still in C2 or in the computer. And there's my water loop out of the system, ready to be drained. I'm actually going to just kind of uh, run a bunch of cleaner through it like I did before because I need to get all the fluids out of it. So that'll be fun to do. That'll be running for a day or so. There we go. All the water cooling gears out. Since we're just doing a motherboard swap, I don't have to mess with the drives or anything, but I do have to, you know, take this motherboard out, which requires removing all the SATA connectors. Any cards that were in there, I had a network card in there or a Wi-Fi card in there that needed to come out. And then all your power and CPU, anything that's plugged in needs to be unplugged, obviously. I'm going to leave the CPU block on there. I'll clean that after I get it out. And then we just remove the motherboard. I'm going to save these screws because they're what came with the case and they're designed for the actual standoff setter in the motherboard. You should always do that. We are going from an EATX to a standard ATX motherboard, which is perfectly fine because I didn't use the EATX standoffs anyway because I'm a lazy daisy. And for those of you wondering why some of these videos wind up being like uh, 20, 25 minutes long, you should know that when you build a computer like this, except for the one where I built one in 24 minutes, which you can watch up there, it actually takes a while, especially if you want to take care with your cable management and the overall aesthetic when you're done. I'm also going to take out one of the coolest features in this case. I say coolest, but it's a convenient feature. The tempered glass mid plate actually comes out which allows me to get full access to everything inside the basement. If you need to change the power supply, you can get right in there. Oh, apparently I did use the EATX standoff. Honestly, the board should have fallen out, so don't do what I just did, guys. Otherwise, your motherboard will go flying. And we are not going to be getting rid of this motherboard because the motherboard works good. The CPU works awesome as a workstation CPU. And what it's going to come down to is me doing something else with it. What that is, I haven't decided yet. That's a lie, I already know what I'm doing with it. Don't forget to unplug your front I.O. and any USB ports. Case number one is ready. This is the main case, this is the one that everything's going into, so what we need to do now is just kind of set it aside, and then I'm going to grab this computer and I'm going to take the motherboard out. Removal of this motherboard is exactly the same as the other one, so you don't need to watch me do it. I'm just going to come back when it's done. Now, before I go ahead and put this into the system, I want to talk about some of the differences and why I know this will be a better overall use case. Number one, this is seventh generation. This is like second or first generation. So the IPCs, just the overall speed of everything on this motherboard is way faster. Now, this motherboard only has dual channel. This has triple channel you're not really sacrificing a whole lot when it comes to speed because this is DDR4, this is DDR3. This has dual M.2 slots and most current motherboards have M.2 spots for NVMEs or regular SATA M.2s. Not all of them, don't quote me, but 90% of them I would probably say. Usually the cooling is better, the power delivery, the phases, the VRMs are usually a lot more beefy and robust. Although this was an extreme motherboard, so it was made for overclocking, so these are really good components. But also these are PCIe Gen 2, these are PCIe Gen 3. This has USB 3.0 support on the motherboard, this one does not. They both had 3.0 on the back. Another thing is this has an integrated GPU just in case, this one does not. And this one is all black, this one is not. So this will go with any build. This one has to be with the black and red build. You can see the size difference between a standard ATX and an EATX motherboard. So the next thing to do is put that one in its right home and set this one aside because as I said, this is definitely going in something and I'll tell you what that is when I get around to it. Unintentionally, let's make this a little bit of a how-to video as we're doing this. And this portion is how to install a motherboard. Number one, you need to put in your back plate, your I.O. shield. It helps prevent dust buildup as well as it cleans up the back of the motherboard. You need to make sure that you have it orientated the right way. Typically, the audios will be on the bottom of the 
shield, so you can usually know to orientate it like that, unless you have a case with a flipped motherboard. Sometimes it takes a little bit of pushing to get them in, sometimes it doesn't. Especially on used components, if they've been jammed into other computer cases, sometimes they don't fit 100% right the first time. So just work it until you get it nice and flush inside. You may not hear a popping noise. Again, that's because the metal of the IO shield, and typically they're going to be metal, has already been stretched before. One thing I would suggest, if you have a motherboard that may cover the entire pass-through, run your power cable up through the back first. That way you'll know that it's in there and you don't have to loosen the motherboard just to refit it. Another thing I would suggest is to take your system, plop your RAM in it of course, and test it before you install it. I'm not doing that because I trust the guy, I know the guy, and I am confident it will work plus I know where he works. So I'm going to go ahead and go on faith. Go ahead and you can usually grab it. If you have an air cooler, a lot of times you can grab it by the air cooler. I'm going to grab it by the heat sink here. Make sure all my cables are out of the way. Set the motherboard down. There you go. And line up all your I.O. with your shield. If you get it all lined up, it should actually line up with all your standoffs as well. Don't worry about hooking up any of your cables yet. You want to get the board screwed down before you start messing with that stuff. And sorry if I kick the tripod from time to time. Typically, if you start the center screw, it will help you align the board because then you can rotate it on the screw kind of like a pivot point. And as long as you use the right screws that come with your case, typically it should come with your standoff screws already, uh, you should be fine and not have to worry about it. If the screw just doesn't start on its own, back it off and try a different one because you may be using the wrong thread. And if you have the wrong thread, it's not going to screw down and you could damage components. You could definitely damage the standoff and then you won't be able to screw down your motherboard which could potentially lead to a short. It's very rare but it does happen. Also some guys will use a power screw or a power screwdriver in order to put these screws in. I don't recommend that especially if you've never built a computer before because if your screwdriver has too much torque you could damage the motherboard, you could cause all kinds of problems. So rule of thumb, use your hands. If you look you'll see I actually used every screw hole and I used the appropriate screws to make sure that this motherboard goes nowhere. Again, better safe than sorry. If you have the hardware, use it. It will make your life a bajillion times easier. And that's an actual percentage. I know that for a fact. Now that we have the motherboard in, IO shields in, we're ready to start wiring it up. One thing I will point out, if you're doing a case swap like I am, sometimes you'll notice that your expansion spots are going to be different. For example, on this motherboard, it's actually going to move me down one slot, so I'll have to move the covers. Don't be surprised if that happens. But you need to wire everything up, including your front panel I.O., your fan headers, your CPU power, your motherboard power, and then we can get to installing all the other parts. You don't need to watch me install them all, so I'll come back to you in a minute. So the AIO is mounted. As you can see, it's a very thin unit, but it should be enough because it's a 240 millimeter unit, and it's only cooling a 7700K, which shouldn't run super duper terribly hot. Now I know that sometimes people have said that they do run a little warm, but uh, we'll just have to wait and see, but I think it should be just fine. Plus it will clean everything up. I did mount it a little bit forward because not only does it have that cooler, but it also has to contend with the 1080s cooler. So I wanted to make sure I had enough room for everything. So next thing to do is take all your like SATAs, your power cables, and everything and wire it all in and then I'm going to put the cooler on. I had to wait till it was standing vertically because there's no like double-sided tape on the piece that goes on the back of the motherboard so I have to hold it in place while screwing it down. I like to use Arctic MX4 for my CPUs and GPUs. It's non-conductive so you should be safe just in case you put a little bit too much on there. However, it's been proven multiple times that it's hard to put too much on there. I'm not going to do the spread method like I tend to do. I'm just going to do the pea size dot method and that should be sufficient for this one. But yeah, let's go ahead and get everything wired up. Now most modern motherboards will be very well marked. As you can see here, it does have the dim channels right there where the shadow is kind of reaching in. And it shows you which one is slots A and slots B. Since it's a dual channel, that's all it has. But make sure you follow your motherboard's instructions, unlike some people on the internet where they'll put two channels 
in just one set of dim slots and then all of a sudden you have single channel RAM and that is absolutely stupid when all new modern CPUs are designed to run at least dual channel. So here we are, we pretty much have it all put together. As you can see it's not 100% done yet, I have to throw the back panel on it as well as a couple other pieces. But let's take a second and take a look at it. As you can see, that's the i7-7700K under a thermal take water 3.0 240mm radiator. EVGA for the win hybrid 1080. Yay. Black and red cables. Meh, nothing I can really do about it. LEDs running around the inside of the system, which I think look good. Gives it a little bit of light, especially since it's all black. It's kind of monochromatic and doesn't look quite as good when it's not on. And then I'm going to go ahead and turn it around and let you take a look at the back. I'm going to turn off the LEDs. There you go. Master class in cable management, right? Uh, I'm out of zip ties. Otherwise, I'd do it all up. I've done it before. I'm going to do it later. But yeah, I do have a deep cool 10 fan splitter back here along with the Thermaltake RGB uh, enclosure up front. Not enclosure, controller. What are you doing, dum-dum? So there you go. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put it over where it's supposed to be, which is right here. And then we're going to boot it up and do a test, see if it works. It should. After all, I built it. Alright, any takers on whether or not it's going to fire up first try? Let's go ahead and turn on the power. Alright, nothing exploded. Hey, we've got a signal. Entering BIOS. There we go. There we go, into the BIOS. Intel Core i7-77 CPU currently clocked at 4.5 gigahertz. He's got it set to expert mode, all cores. Again, this being a used CPU and a used motherboard, it's retaining his original things. 1.254 volts, which is not terrible. It's not hateful. Let's see, all right, let's go ahead and make sure that we boot to the right item. Yes, I have two SSDs and two spinning hard drives, because why wouldn't you? Let's see what happens. And by the way, I wasn't doing it by magic, I'm using a different keyboard. Corsair Strafe keyboards are nice, but a lot of times they don't actually uh, work to get you in a BIOS on a new boot. So, let's see what happens when it goes into Windows. Probably going to take a minute since it's new hardware. So as you can see, we've booted up to Windows. Everything seems to be working fine. I haven't peeled the other piece of plastic off the main glass yet, just because, I don't know, I'll do it at some point. But yeah, everything seems to be working. Next thing I'll do is a little bit of video capture to show you that it's working fine, and then we'll close out the video. So hopefully you learned something from that little thing. I know it wasn't like the most in-depth assembly guide or like a official build guide, but I think I talked about a few tips and tricks that most of your average builders should be doing and novice builders might not even know. So hopefully you got something out of that. Uh, when I film by myself, which is 99% of the time, I don't have anybody around with me to remind me to hit the record button, so sometimes I miss chunks of video. Sometimes the camera's pointed the wrong way. It's hard for me to remember to put it on whatever I'm doing because I get so into what I'm doing, I just kind of zone out. And I do apologize about that. I'm going to try to get a little bit more uh, consistent with what I'm doing there. Sorry, brain fog. As this computer sits, and as I intimated to, what I have into this computer makes it a dollar to performance bargain screaming deal and you can even improve upon what I've done here and I have done it although it's very difficult if you get the exact same deal I did. I'll put up a couple of uh, examples here of going prices for components such as the i7 that's in it as well as the motherboard and the RAM because what I paid for these parts versus what they even sell for used on sites like Amazon, Newegg, eBay, I paid less than half of what those prices are. And in a lot of cases, I paid a quarter of what those prices are because I was consistently waiting for the right opportunity. And now that I'm thinking about it, that's gonna be the name of this computer. It's Project Opportunity. Hopefully that's not trademarked like when I called one Snow Leopard without realizing it was a Mac thing. Because Apple, 
For those of you interested, I will do a quick breakdown. If you were to go on eBay and build this computer right now using eBay, which is of the three I mentioned, Amazon, Newegg, and eBay, probably the cheapest. It might even be cheaper than Craigslist because you're also getting a guarantee if it doesn't work and they said it did. But if you go to buy an i7-7700K right now, you're going to pay between $275 and $300 for the chip. The motherboard, if you go with a basic Z270 like this, what basic is not really the right term, but if you go with an entry level Z270, it's about 70 bucks, 50 to 70, we'll say 50. So that's three and a quarter already, and I have 200 into that. A 32 gigabyte kit of RAM at 3200 megahertz, if you went to buy a new set like G-Skill Trident Z, you're talking 150 bucks. If you're talking about the same kind of Rampage stuff, it's probably still 150 bucks. AIO cooler, 240 millimeter with ring LED fans and an LED controller or RGB controller, probably another 150 bucks. The power supply is an 850 BQ from EVGA. They still make them, they still sell them, and they're still like $110. You can probably find one used for like 80 bucks. The storage inside of it is probably the cheapest components because I scavenged those, well, most of the parts are scavenged from other deals I made, but I have two SSDs and two spinning hard drives for a total of three and a half terabytes of storage which is more than enough for me because I don't film in 4k or anything like that. The fans in there it's got right now six or five uh, thermal take ring LED fans not counting the ones on the cooler and those are probably about 60-70 bucks for the sets. Um, the graphics card, which is one of the biggest components in any PC build, is a GTX 1080 for the win hybrid by EVGA. I think I just said that. My brain doesn't work all the time. Pardon. If you go to buy that right now on used sites, you're going to pay around $350 to $400. It's a for the win board, has better power delivery, it's not a founder's edition, and it's a damn nice card. And it does great frame rates at 1080p and 1440p. So all told, if you went out to build this computer and you just bought the components without paying for tax, without paying for shipping or anything like that, just the price of the components, you're still talking about almost $1,200. I have under six into it. And six is on the high end because some of the components I've had for a while, some of the components I bought using money from other sales in which I made massive profits. But we'll just say for the sake of argument that I have about $600 into this and I have an i7 7700K, I have a GTX 1080, 32 gigs of RAM, all kinds of cool stuff in here. It runs beautiful and for just that little bit of outlay over say a console like a PS4 Pro and five games, you have a computer that will be capable of running most AAA titles at a very playable frame rate for the general foreseeable future. I never say future proofing because there's no such thing as that. But there are some things in the works, such as I'm probably going to get rid of that 1080 because a buddy of mine is selling me his 1080 Ti. And for a gamer who doesn't worry about 4K or ray tracing, 1080 Ti is still, in my, uh, in my opinion, the sweet spot. So that's about it. Thank you so much for watching this. Again, if you liked it, give me that thumbs up. Leave a comment down below. Uh, subscribe. And if you actually stayed through the entire video, unlike a lot of viewers who can't seem to muster more than three minutes to watch a video, the treasure is buried under the giant X behind the Ramada Inn in Louisville. Let me know what you find. And, as always, I'll talk to you later.